in chapter 1 with Daniel, uh, or Daniel, David, uh, David uh, as he ascends to the throne of Israel in uh, 2 Samuel, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel. Um, one of them. One of them. The book of 1 Samuel is the story of Samuel and Saul, and the, and, and the second Samuel is the story of David. Well, the first ten chapters of the book of 2 Samuel are among my favorites. But then I get to chapter 11 in 2 Samuel. And uh, I've gotten to a point where when I read through the book of 2 Samuel... I almost don't want to turn the page when I get done with chapter 10 yeah. because chapter 11 is where the wheels come off of David's life. And uh, the first 10 chapters of the book of 2 Samuel are all fantastic. They talk about David's ascension to the throne and all of his, a lot of his victories and, and the things that he, that he did and, and it's where God promised him and made covenant with him that uh, that he he was going to become David and and uh, but then in in chapter eleven is it it's where David sees Bathsheba and we all know the story and uh, from Second Samuel chapter eleven through the end of the book it's really kind of challenging to read and and uh, uh Ironically enough, the story of Solomon takes place in the book of First Kings, and the first ten chapters of the book of First Kings are all the positive things about Solomon's reign. And in the eleventh chapter, the same thing happens, where Solomon's life gets derailed. And uh, I, I was thinking about this this morning. I'm not sure if that's why they call it Chapter 11 back, Bankruptcy or not. <laughs> but I feel like they should. Because, uh, <clears throat> so I, I was, uh, God gave me this word out of Second Samuel Chapter 15. We all know the story of David's life. We know how David... Uh, was uh, such a powerful man of God. And uh, we know how, how God blessed him and the covenant God made with him. But then we also all know the story of Bathsheba. We all know how David uh, uh, saw her and then they had this adulterous affair and then David killed uh, Bathsheba's husband. They had a baby. Uh, that was conceived before. Uh, it's just a nasty, horrible story. It's one that I, I've often asked God, why do you even put that in the Bible? I mean, why can't we just like, why do we have to include all that? But, but God put it in there for a reason. And then everything that happened in David's life after this, this horrible part of his life it seemed like David's family just fell apart. When you read, when you read the, the uh, after 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 the, the the story of the part about Bathsheba and how uh, their baby dies because of 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 God's judgment and God's uh, is part of the part of the result of this this horrible sin, and then. Uh, and then David's other family, Absalom, or, or starts with his son Amnon, yeah. who, uh, it's hard for me to talk about this stuff. Amnon, who is one of David's sons, uh, actually rapes his own sister and, and then casts her aside. And then as a result of that, Absalom, another one of David's sons, has Amnon killed and, and, uh, and then Absalom is, is uh, forced into exile, and, and eventually he's brought back. And then Absalom himself rebels against David and tries to take over the throne. And uh, so I'm, I'm reading these stories, and, and I come across uh, 2 Samuel 15, because as a result of uh, 
as a result of, of this, this, of this uh, sin that David committed, David's family is just a disaster. And uh, it's hard to, it's hard to understand how, how someone like David, who, who God himself said about David, that David was a man after God's own heart. It's, it's hard to understand how David could be such a great king and such a highly esteemed man of God, but yet be such a horrible father. Because his family was a disaster. And uh, there's often times I question God and I say, well, how can this be? How can, how can any of this be? make any sense but th that's the story read the read the story it's in it's in the bible it's part of the yeah. it's part of the holy scripture and uh so in in second samuel 15 david has gotten word that absalom has has uh plotted to literally steal the throne from him it wasn't it wasn't that that absalom stumbled into something. This was something Absalom planned. He would sit at the gate. He was, he was exiled because of, of uh, murdering his own brother. He was sent into exile, but then a couple years later, David uh, actually brought him back to the kingdom and, and sort of restored him into, into a position of good grace. And you would think that Absalom would be eternally thankful for that, but he wasn't. He was bitter and he was angry. And, and so Absalom actually uh, premeditated and planned a, 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 a devious plan how to overthrow, take the throne from his own dad. And uh, what he would do, what, uh, there's several things he did, but one of the things he would do is he would sit outside the, the, uh, the, the gate to the palace. And as people would come in to see the king, they would come in to to have their problems taken care of when you had a problem in the kingdom and you needed uh, sort of uh, legal uh, justice done. If you had a situation, you would come to the palace and you would hopefully get in to see the king and then the king would hear your case and, and the king would judge your case and then he would make a decision based on the information. And so Absalom would sit outside the, the palace and as people would come into the palace, he would sit there, and as they were walking in, he would say, hey, come on over here, I want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And the people would come all over, and he'd say, why, why are you here today? And the people that were coming in, a lot of times, had real issues. They had real problems and challenges, things that maybe they had been mistreated, or, or maybe they had had land stolen from them. They had real problems. And Absalom would sit there, and he would say, Oh, well, that's that's really that's a hard story to hear, and and he would listen to their story, and then as they would tell him their story, he would say, "Man, that's really hard." He said, "It's really too bad that the king doesn't really have time to deal with this the way it should be dealt with." Mm -hmm. And he and and then he would then he would tell the person, he would say, "Boy, if if I were in charge, mm -hmm. if I were king, I would take care of this for you." And he would sit there day after day after day and do this with, as people would come into the, into the palace. And a lot of these people were the, uh, they, they were the people that, that had property and had money and they had influence in the kingdom. So it wasn't just the, the common citizens that he was doing this to. He was, he was talking to what we would consider like the movers and the shakers. They were the landowners. They were the people that had uh, influence with all the other people. And so those people would go back to their village or back to their town, and they'd say, you know, David's okay, but boy, that Absalom, he's really got some good ideas. We should listen to him. Boy, if he was king, we wouldn't have to put up with all of these problems. A lot of these people that were coming to the palace, they weren't just coming with their problem, they might be coming with the problem to a whole village. Mm -hmm. And so when Absalom would listen to their problems and pretend to, to be their friend, he was, he was literally stealing the hearts of the people away from David. And he did this for years. Wow. 
until finally he had, there was enough murmuring and enough, there, and, and you know how people are. Yeah. We see it today. We see how people react. They, they, get, they get half of the story or part of the story, yeah. and, and they get told, hey, you're important. And so that's what Absalom did. He told the people by, by doing this, he would tell them, you're important to me. You're not important to the king. You're important to me. And so by this political maneuvering, he stole the hearts of the people. And so the, the murmuring started, the jabbering started. And it started out away from the palace. It started out away from Jerusalem. In the kingdom of Israel, the, the people of Israel started talking. They started saying, what is Absalom guy? He's got some good ideas. And have you seen Absalom? He's a really good looking guy. Mm -hmm. And he's young, and, and, and he understands what it's like to be to, to know what we, the next generation, are going through. And, and you know, David's getting kind of old. And his ideas are kind of old-fashioned, and, and they don't always work. And, and we've got all these problems in the kingdom. And so Absalom, at this point, is, is just sort of keeping his mouth shut. But he's got his spies out there, and he's got... He's got people out there that are listening to this, and they're and they're sort of fanning these flames of rebellion, wow. until finally something happens, and and somebody finally says it right out in the open. We need to make Absalom king, mm. and of course Absalom plays the game, and he says, "Oh no, and I don't want to be king." And, of course, that makes the people say, no, 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 we need you. Wow. And they think it's their idea. Mm. And so, and so this, goes on, this, is a, this goes on over a period of years. And through this whole process, Absalom plays this, this devious game where he's taking over his own father's kingdom. And uh, so it finally gets to a point, and Absalom gets talked in to doing something that he planned on all along. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he finally, he finally says, okay, so I don't really want this job. I'm, I'm, this is, I'm only doing this because the kingdom needs me. And so he allows himself to be talked in, and they call this big meeting, and they have this, this, this whole thing is planned out, and they call all the popular people that have political power, people that have money, they all gather together in this place, and, and finally it's declared, you know what, we're going to make Absalom king. And David gets word of this in, in uh, chapter 15 of the book of 2 Samuel. All of this... All of this is a direct result and, and stems from, Dan, uh, from David's downfall, David's sin that he committed with Bathsheba. All of this has taken place. And so that's where we pick up the story in verse uh, 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 15. It says, A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Mm. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. I grew up in church. I grew up uh, listening to... to Pastors, and I, I grew up listening to preachers, and I, I really don't want to preach this today, hmm. because because preachers, the, the the preaching that I grew up under was always about answers. Hmm. It was always about it was always about uh, sort of. Uh, giving people what they needed from God. And I have to be honest with you, I feel that here. I spend, I spend a lot of time, of, of my time, I spend listening to God. And a lot of, a lot of, a, a lot of the, the, the conversation that I have with Holy Spirit during the week is, is me telling God, Lord, I need, I need you to show me what you have for your people. 
I, I need, I, I need to, I, 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 I want to give them what they need yes. because I know when, when we come together this Saturday, there's, 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 there's people that are dealing with real issues in your life and God knows my heart. God knows that I, I, I want to, to, uh, I want, I want God to give us what we need, to give us the answers. And I feel like today's message is actually going to have more questions in it than it does answers. I've gotten sort of used to that in my life. Because a lot of times when God speaks to me, a lot of times the answers that he gives me to the things I talk to him about actually have more questions in it. It's like when, when God answers one question, the answer has six more questions in it. If that makes any sense. A lot of times that's how it feels with me. I'm, I'm kind of, I, I'm kind of, uh, that's sort of, I, I'm used to it. I, and I, my relationship with God is, is I, I'm used to, to asking why. And, uh, as, as God was speaking to me this week, I, I, I kept thinking, but God, these really aren't, the, 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 what, this really isn't an answer to the question. It's just more answer. It's just more questions. But, but uh, what Holy Spirit told me is he said, there's an, there, there is, there's an answer in the question that makes it, it doesn't even make any sense to me. <laughs> but, it, but that's what he told me. He said, there's answers in the questions. So when, when you have questions before God, a lot of times what they taught me in church, what I learned growing up in church, is that we shouldn't ask God questions. We shouldn't ask God why. Because there's, there's several people in this room right now that have some pretty big whys bouncing around in your head right now. You're wondering some things. Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? And, uh, and, and you're not getting any answers necessarily. All you're getting is more questions. But what I'm telling you is there's answers in those questions. And it's okay for you to keep asking God those questions. It's okay to have honest conversation with Holy Spirit. In fact, I think... Holy Spirit wants you to have those kind of conversations with him. I don't think, I, I, I think this whole idea of, of religion is, it's all based on us hiding from God. Because we don't want to be honest with him. And I found out that God wants us to be honest with him. I call it getting naked before God. He wants you to strip away all of your pretense, all of your, all of the things that, 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 that it's like it's like when we go to church on Sunday morning. I don't, maybe you don't do it. I did it. When I go to church on Sunday morning, I'd get up and, and put on my Sunday go to meeting clothes. And uh, back in the day, it was a suit and tie. Thank God I've been delivered from that. <laughs> but I'd put on a suit and tie and I'd go to church. And when I put on that suit and tie, I'd also put on sort of this uh, almost like a spiritual like sort of phylactery type of a thing that was sort of like my pharisaical robe that I would put on so that I could go in front of all of you people. And, and, and you guys all played the same game. Yeah. Not you, but the people that were in my church. We all played the same game, and so we all put on these, these robes. You couldn't see them with your eyes, but they were there. It was like this spiritual sort of like identity that we put on for Sunday morning we show up at church and and uh, you know you you could go to church and you could ride the whole way to church and just have a knockdown drag out fight with your wife the whole way to church and you'd be slapping the kids in the back seat and you'd be you'd be no we didn't do that to be honest with you my wife we didn't fight but but we could be angry with each other and we did that we I'm, I'm not a fighter I don't like to fight so my fighting is different. I do it very quietly. I just don't say anything. That's, that's how I fight. It's not a good way to fight. It's just how I do it. I'm not, I'm not advocating. and I'm just saying that's how my personality is. So, so I could ride the whole way to church and be mad at her 
and angry about it. I wouldn't say anything, but the fighting was still there. The spirit of it was there. Yes. You get what I'm saying? Yes. And and we be we could be mad at the kids. Mm -hmm. And we weren't, you know, I never I never hit my kids out of anger. I spanked them, but I didn't hit I never hit my kids out of anger. I never raised my voice to my kids. But but I, there was a way that you could be trust me on this, there was a way to do this. It, and, and we did it sometimes, not every Sunday, but there were times, and it usually involved us being late. <laughs> I hated to be late. Absolutely, I still hate to be late. But I, I, I'd be sitting out in the, in, the, in the driveway, in the car, waiting for the kids to come out and waiting for Cindy to come out. I'd just be steaming. <laughs> And so we could fight the whole way to church like that. Just be angry. And I'd be like, mm, the steam would be coming out of my ears. I wouldn't be saying anything. And she wouldn't know I was mad. She'd be sitting over on her side of the thing, you know, and you have the whole body language thing going on. And so we'd do that the whole way to church. Now, some of you actually had the, the words going on. Some of you were like, you know, you didn't keep it bottled in. You were like, and, and, and there was actual physical altercations going on. It depends on how you, how you operate it. So, but you could do that the whole way to church. But then what would happen is you'd get out of the, out of the car, you'd walk into the thing, and the preacher would be standing at the back door, and immediately, boom, those, those, those religious robes would come on, and, and it would be all smiles. And, Hi, Pastor, how you doing today? Boy, it's just a glorious day. How going the Lord doing? Oh, we're all just doing fantastic. We're one big happy family, and there's nothing wrong here. Nothing to see here. So we woke up this morning just rejoicing in the Lord, and uh, something happened on the way to church that we were no longer rejoicing in the Lord, but we don't talk about that. So, so that's, that's, so, so I, that's the environment that I was sort of taught that that's not what we're doing today. No. That's a long story to tell to get to know. <laughs> <laughs> but David found himself. David found himself in a situation that some of you find yourself in today. Not everybody, but here's what. Here's what. If you're not in the situation that I'm going to talk about today, at some point you're going to be. Yes. If you live long enough and you walk with God long enough, I promise you this. You are going to someday find yourself in a situation where you're going to ask God, why is this happening? And you are not going to get an answer that you like. All you're going to get is more questions. Now, David found himself in this position because David found himself running from his own son. And he found himself telling the people around him, we've got to leave because Absalom's coming. If we don't get out of town now, he's not going to let us leave. We're not going to live through the night. And so David literally had to pack up whatever they could carry on their backs. Remember, this is David. This is, the, this is the guy that killed Goliath. This is the king that God said, this was a man after his own heart. This was the, this was the man that fought the Philistines. This was the man that, that, that built the, the nation of Israel up. This was the man that God had promised someday that, that you, I'm going, to, I'm going to make your name great. This is the David we're talking about. David finds out that his own son has, has rebelled and is coming with, with the intent to kill him. And he tells the people, we've got to leave. We've got to move quickly. So the king, the, king of the, the, the greatest king that Israel ever had, we see him literally grabbing what he can carry with his, with his uh, entourage, his, his mighty men, only they're not so mighty at this point. Right. And we see him fleeing for his life. He says, we must leave immediately or Absalom will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. So the, so the, the king, David, is literally fleeing for his life. 
And the whole time he's fleeing for his life, understand something. David is a man, just like you and I. He has thoughts and emotions and feelings. And, and, and at this point, you, if you can put yourself in David's shoes for just a minute, you'll know what he feels like. And so he's quickly grabbing what he can carry. And he's running out of the, out of the city that he built. And the people are watching him go. And no doubt there was people that were watching him flee that were standing on the side of the road and they're sort of waving and saying, good riddance. Wow. It's hard to imagine the despair and the depth of, of David's emotion at this point. Yes. But he had a real problem. It says in verse 17, So the king set out with all the people following him, and they halted at the edge of the city. And as David's standing there, all of his, all of his the, the men that had fought with him all through the, the, the time when Saul was chasing him years ago, and they had stood by David, and now David has to stand and watch them walk out with their tail tucked between their legs and running from Absalom. Because if they don't, they know that the city is going to come under siege and that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so David decides that they need to leave. It says in verse 23, the whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. Zadok was there too. Zadok was the high priest and he was there and all the Levites were with him. And they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Then the king said to Zadok, this is The king said to Zadok, take the ark of God back into the city. David had the unique opportunity. When he was running from his son Absalom, when he had reached probably the absolute lowest that a man could reach. And all he was getting was more questions instead of answers. Part of the, part of the challenge that David had at this moment in his life is that he had created the mess that he was in. Mm -hmm. He was in this situation because of poor choices that he made. He was in this situation not... He wasn't innocent. And so David, as he's running for his life, and as, he, as he's wondering, will I ever see... Jerusalem again. Will I ever be back here? See, we know the rest of his story. Yes. We know how this ends for David. Yes. We know that, the, that in, in a few more uh, verses, in a couple chapters later, we know that Absalom is going to meet up with the David's men. And we know that Absalom is going to be killed. And we know that David, if you read the rest of 2 Samuel, you'll know that, that David is brought back to Jerusalem. And we know how David's story goes from here. What we don't know is where your story goes from today. Because some of you are sitting where David was sitting that day. You're sitting in a situation and you're asking God, what is going on? Why am I pay why how am I going to 
live through this. You can't claim innocence. You can't even, you're like David, you can't claim that you don't deserve to be here. But it still doesn't give you any answers. And you're like David. David here, as he was leaving the city, he told the people that were with them, he said, I'm at the mercy of God. And David never quit asking God for his mercy. And so when Zadok and the high priest showed up, they had the ark of God with them. Understand, the ark of God was the, was the, 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 the very presence of God. It was the very glory of God. It was, it was, the, it was the, the, the box, if you will, where the presence of God actually dwelt. It wasn't just, a, it wasn't just a, a piece of furniture. It was a sacred thing. And it really did represent the, the power of God and the glory of God. Now understand something here. David, in the absolute worst moment of his life, when he's being run out of town by his own son, not knowing if he's going to survive, not knowing if he's going to live, all of a sudden has the opportunity to, to literally bring the glory of God into his battle. Because that's what the ark of God represented. When the, when the nation of Israel, when the ark of God, remember, it was the ark of God, it was the ark of the covenant that went before the, the, the armies of Israel when they attacked Jericho. It was the ark of God that, that would go before the Israelites as they walked through the, the, the wilderness. Back in the day when they were coming out of Egypt. It was the ark of God that, that, that uh, God had given Moses the, the, the directions to build. It was the ark of God that literally carried the presence of God or the glory of God with the armies of Israel when they would go into battle. And so here's David and he's fighting for his life and he's fighting for his reputation He's fighting for his kingdom, not knowing if he's going to be alive tomorrow. And here's the ark of God or the glory of God right on his doorstep. Now, this is not Sunday morning church. This is more like something that happens on Tuesday morning. But notice what David does. He says... Take the ark, take the glory of God, and take it back into the city because that's where it belongs. Mm. This is a hard word because what I'm getting ready to say to you. This is what God told me. We need to be careful that we don't make our battles God's battles. Now listen very carefully. I'm not saying God's not interested in your battles. But we as Christians sometimes have a tendency to make our battles the thing that we're interested in, the thing that we want. We have a tendency to want to take the name of God and and apply that to our battle. David said this battle that I'm facing with my son Absalom he didn't quit asking God for help but he said, I'm not going to make my battle God's battle. He said, the glory of God belongs in Jerusalem. I struggled with this this week. Because all I got was questions about this. I think, I think it was in this moment when David stood on this dusty side road and had the
the glory of God available because all he had to do was tell Zadok and the priest, bring that ark along with me because I want the glory of God involved in my agenda. The problem would have been if David would have done that, what would have happened to God's agenda? David said, take the ark, take the glory of God back to where it belongs because God has a different agenda. And my agenda is not going to become God's agenda. I think this is when David became David was in this moment right here. Because instead of him making it all about himself, he kept his eye focused. He kept his he kept his focus on what God's agenda was. You remember the story of Joshua when the children of Israel had come into the promised land? And right before they attacked Jericho, right before they started to engage the enemies in the promised land, Joshua was out wandering around and he, he met the angel of God. Remember when Joshua asked the man, he said, whose side are you on? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Remember what the angel of God said? He said, neither. He said, he was telling Joshua, and I believe this is why David knew where the ark of God was supposed to be. The angel was telling Joshua, he said, God has his own agenda. And his agenda is never going to be subservient to your agenda. There's a danger when you're faced with situations that you don't have answers for. And that danger is that you'll, you'll start to, you'll start to make, you'll start to try to make God's identity your identity. You'll start to try to make God's agenda your agenda. Because all of a sudden, it becomes all about you. Then you, then you start predicting God's going to do this, God's going to do that. Uh, you start right. thinking that you are God. Right. Do you remember Genesis chapter 3? The lie, yes. the first lie yes. that the liar told, this lie was embedded in that lie. Mm. Because remember what the liar said to Eve? Mm. If you eat this fruit, mm. you'll be like God. Mm. Yeah. And what God is saying to us today is when, we're, when you're facing your ultimate challenge when you don't know which end is up and you don't know what, what's going to happen that's when you're the most likely to want to be like God rather than to be God there's a difference and when you're in the situation where you're in the time of your life like David was here where everything's gone to pot and your your life is falling apart and you feel like no matter it, it you feel like there's no way that you're going to come out ahead that's when you need to look to God and say you know what God I'm staying with your agenda yes. what's important to you and you need to subvert your agenda to his agenda at that point that's what David did. In this, the most crucial 
part of his life. When there was nobody around him to support him. When he was fleeing from his life. When he didn't know if he was coming back tomorrow. David still said, God, the ark, the glory, needs to stay where it belongs. He said, take the ark back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. God can fix every situation in your life. I don't care how many mistakes you made. I don't care what the circumstances are as a direct result of those mistakes. God can overcome those circumstances. He can fix it. He can turn things around. But there's a difference between what God can do and what he will do. Because sometimes you need to go, you need to go through what David went through. You need to find yourself on some back dusty road where you have nothing going for you. And in that moment, what you decide is going to determine where your heart is. Doreen, when I was reading this this week, it occurred to me this was the greatest worship of David's life. And that's saying something. Because many of the psalms that we use for worship, many of much of the music that we play today, and a lot of the a lot of the 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 formulas that we follow for worship were handed down to us from David. He was like one of the ultimate worshipers. But I believe in this moment when David poured his heart out to God and said, God, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if you're going to restore me, if you're going to bring me back, but God, I'm leaving it up to you. I believe in this moment that, that this was one of the most purest times of worship in David's life. We have a tendency, we have a tendency as human beings to want to run from these moments. To want to get out of them any way we can. Much of the time, the human race, if you, if you look at our history and even your own history, you know that it's a lot of times in these times is when you start looking to, to other forms of escape. Whether it's alcohol or drugs or some kind of, some kind of something just to take your mind off your problem. Mm -hmm. But what I'm telling you is when you're in this time. And some of you are in this time right now. You're in situations and you're going through things that you don't understand. And you don't know how it's going to work out. And you're wondering, why is this happening to me? And then, and then you start realizing, well, partly it's happening because of poor choices that I made. But it's in this moment that your worship can become the purest. It's when you can come into agreement with him rather than you. Because in this moment, David chose God's way rather than his way. He knew the power of that ark. He knew if he took that, it would almost guarantee him a victory over Solomon. But he refused to use God's glory for his own agenda, for his own plan, even in the darkest time of his life. Folks, listen to me and I'm done. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I don't. But God knows. God knows 
I would love nothing better than to stand up here and tell you, well, this is what give you some kind of a formula to follow to get out from underneath what you're going through so that you don't have to deal with it anymore. Might be physical healing you need, might be financial issues, might be emotional issues, might be uh, family issues, might be, uh, I, I don't know what it is. And I would love nothing better than for God to speak to me prophetically and for me to be able to stand up here on Saturday and say, well, this is all you got to do and, and, and have a formula that you can follow and say, if you do this, this, and this, then everything's going to clear itself up. God doesn't work that way. <coughs> because if you've tried those formulas... I guarantee you, you're going to someday wake up and realize that the formulas don't work. Mm -hmm. And you're going to sit there and you're going to scratch your head and you're going to say, but I did everything I knew to do. I did everything the pastor said. I did everything that I did everything I was supposed to do. And here I'm still it's still not working. But I'm telling you, there's a powerful opportunity in this time that you're in right now. And if you're not in it right now, stick this message and this word in your back pocket or in your pocketbook and hang on to it because someday you're going to find yourself exactly where I'm talking about. And when that time comes, whether it's today or tomorrow, realize that it's an opportunity for you to come into perfect alignment with what God is doing. It's a time and opportunity for you to come into perfect worship. I haven't really thought a whole lot about how we're doing communion today. But here's the one thing I know we need to do during communion today. We need to focus and pay attention to the broken body of Christ as we take the bread. Because there's something about Us coming into agreement with his broken body and coming into brokenness with him that'll help us through these times. Jesus said when, when he was with his disciples, he said, this is my body which was broken for you. Jesus knew what this situation was going to be. It's ironic that what David went through that day on that in that street with the Ark of God, the same thing was going to happen to Jesus some 3,000 years later. Because he too was going to find himself in the same situation that David found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you know that story, you know that Jesus dealt with the same thing that David dealt with. Because Jesus had to make the same choice that David made on that dusty street. Because that night in the Garden, if you remember what Jesus prayed, he said, Father, I don't really want to do this. I don't really want to go through this. I don't, I, you know, I've never quite been able to fully understand and grasp how much of Jesus was man and how much of him was God. But I believe in the Garden of Gethsemane, the humanity of Jesus was in full force. And he faced the same decision that, that David faced. And he had that same ark with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus, the same as David, said, no, 
the ark needs to go back to Jerusalem mm. where the glory of God can be in full effect. And that day in the garden, Jesus picked up his cross. That's why when we celebrate communion, we have the opportunity today to come into agreement with that same brokenness that Jesus dealt with, that David dealt with. I don't understand why we have to go through these things. I don't. But I believe with all my heart that it's an opportunity for us to come into agreement with what God is doing and put our own agenda on hold.